you know. And then I distribute whatever I can to a group of about 600 hockey a crazy coaches and leaders to hope they pay it forward and pass it on for the good of the game. And uh, I want to get into the myth and grit of what you and Dean and I think Tom and myself, I'm just basically getting my feet wet to dare to just play games, small area games, half ice, whole ice, varieties of games, and stop those flow drills and teaching stations and repet repetition and correction. So <clears throat> that's what I want to get into is you were doing this since the get-go. Dean, were you doing that the game's idea when you work with Julie in the 2000s, or did you pick it up from John? Dean, would you elaborate on that? Elaborate because on that, because you're, you're doing a dog. Yes, um, I was a typical traditional skill and drill coach um, when I started back in the um, mid 80s, early 80s, and uh, was frustrated with what I felt was a the middle part of the bell curve for the most part when it comes to measuring performance through results at uh you know double a triple a level and in, in the junior and was searching for the holy grail how how could i help my teams become better yeah. and you know the metric i was really focusing on in my early days was winning because i wanted to climb that that ladder and um, very frustrated, tried everything, went everywhere, attended symposiums. I met John that year I was with Julie at U of C in, I guess, 2003. And after that year, Julie stepped down and I took over. And it was essentially John and myself for the next couple of years. And we had um, Josh Dixon came in one year, Janelle Bodie came in one year as assistants. And... Um, John really, uh, you know, I, I, he, he subtly and directly greatly influenced my thinking around the game's model. Prior to that, I had met Tom Malloy at a Hockey Alberta facilitators training session in downtown Calgary. And, and Tom, I, I can't remember the year. I don't know if he's still on now, but um, that was about, that was in the early 90s. And, and Tom and I struck up, I think that was the first time I had met Tom, and we struck up a couple of conversations over coffee. And he was, you know, he was sharing the genesis of his hockey coaching ABCs stuff before he even wrote it. And I think Tom put his first edition out in 98, and he gave me a signed copy. I've still got it like John does. And, you know, I think, Wally, there was a, you know, I was open to a lot of different influences, and I think on the game-based model, Tom was probably one of the first that was starting to put some of the stuff out that I knew because we had no internet at this time, right? Mm -hmm. It was all face-to-face -face or seminar or course-based. Um, you know, remember the old drill of the month uh, on the faxes? We'd send faxes out. And, um, you know, and, and then when I met John, um, that daily presence of his observation skills and commentary and questioning, his questioning approach. John was never in your face and saying, Dean, you're full of crap. This doesn't work. You need to change. You're so antiquated. You know, and I think the beauty of that was, is that he was a multi-sport guy. He had both soccer and hockey background already. And I don't want to speak for John, but I know he kind of went through a similar evolution of skill and drill, experiencing frustration at the results, and then starting to ask himself, why, why is this not better? So I, I really appreciated that chance encounter with the stranger observing in the stands because John and I, you know, we're best friends and we've worked together ever since that year. And we continue to push and challenge each other on the boundaries of using game, the game-based approach. 
Well, Dean, I, I'd like to share a story, my story uh, at at the Oval, coaching the the Oval team for Shannon Miller while she was centralized. Joan Vickers was uh, a uh, Dr. Vickers, a professor, and she had her class observe a practice. And I ran what I thought at the time was a perfect practice. Um, I got called into the Oval Director's office about my ice time, which he said, according to Joan's class, and the evaluation was uh, needed some work. And I was taken aback because I ran a typical deliberate pass here, pass here, shoot here, key teaching points constantly being reinforced. And the gist of it was coming from Joan to the person that hired me was that everything was no decision making. They were doing everything at executing the skill in the drill at the moments. And I was giving them feedback, positive feedback on it, trying to teach it. And it was typical. So I learned about the inquiry method of coaching. I, I realized games, letting them play and figure things out was going to be part of solution. And boy, I, I had an earlier lesson when I first started coaching hockey, and I've told it too many times about Ken Brackle asking me to coach Bantam AA, and I ran deliberate practices to the point of taking a, the most talented peewee age players. Uh, I had them in fourth place, but after talking to Ken on the idea of letting them play games, small area games, uh, we did win the Eskimo Minor Hockey Week City Championship in the Provincials. So that story really resonates with me. So, John, the work you're doing, which is something we're really familiar with as a group, um, I wonder if you can give me your take on where you think we're at right now, uh, sports are at. Has, has it gotten better? Uh, have you watched hockey? Has it changed at all? Go ahead, John. Well, I I believe uh, you know the over the years what I've been observing is is yeah it's been a change and I think we're more aware everyone who have played the game who have watched the game who have teach the game have become more aware of the possibilities of you know doing. Um, things in a different way. And I think we all, people is searching for uh, those solutions. And and I think that's the beauty of it. Uh, it's a lot of sharing like your group and, you know, I've been following you guys, observing your uh, comments and listen to your um, YouTube. And, 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 and I think it's great. I, I think we are looking for things. So now from that, I, I think, it is a space that needs to be filled. Is is how we apply these ideas and how we explore these concepts and and we put them in practice. I think that's where we need to um, start getting more involved in exploring. You know, I when I do coaching clinics and we share ideas with the coaches, one of the things we really talk about is. Don't be afraid to go there and explore and, and let the, um, the game be the teacher in a way because you need to control certain parameters. You need to be there um, structuring these games so in a way they can become learning tools. And, and I think that's where we need to be um, more efficient at uh, doing it. And I think everybody go through a process. I, I, I honestly, I, I started like every coach. I, I was looking for solutions. Uh, I follow everyone. I, professional teams, everyone, and I observe. And and then I, got my kids, uh, junior. You know when they were young, and I, and I try. You know when you coach youth kids, seven, eight years old, five. I say, how are we going to do this? And and that 
drove me to start designing games. And that's what I think is the, the most critical part is, is to start designing them and put them in practice. You know, I follow the, when I came to Calgary, I follow the symposiums like Dean say, and I, you know, everybody goes for the drill book. Hey, what is the drill book? I need the drill book. And I, I tell you, I had a collection of drill books. I, and now with the advent of internet, you have access to millions of drills and, and stuff like that. But my question was always how I can do better and how I can create, design something that where my kids can become more creative, can really express themselves on their own, not me telling them what to do. Uh, you got to do this. You got to do that, especially when they're young. Because that's when I think creativity is really, uh, really flourish and, and really becomes the essence of, I think, game um, intelligence or uh, sense. And I think we need to be very careful. But I think it's been uh, an immense progress in the United States uh, with the model of uh, training, game model that they have designed. Uh, game, you know, small area games and all that. And, but I think it's always place for more and, and to keep, you know, pushing that boundary of how can we do better every day and, and how we can do, you know, on the girls side, I, you know, I've been coaching women for a long time and girls. Um, basically, I got a team now in Vancouver and soccer. They gave me a... Um, a U17 girls team uh, for a year because they finish next year. But, you know, uh, me and my son here uh, have taken the team and it's uh, BCSPL is like a, the top uh, here in BC. And we're very excited. And, and again, it's not because they're 17, they're the best. They are the, at the best level, but I think it's a matter of um, how we can make them better. How can we promote and, and, and these players to a uh, better understanding of the game and so on. So, yeah, no, to like, go back to your question, yeah, I think it's definitely um, a huge space here for uh, progression and, you know, that's, that's, yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm just going to uh, bring up a point related to that, and then I'll ask anyone else if you have any questions. And Dean, um, I think you're, I do know that your, your research that you've been spending years on and finally completing your doctorate on this topic, the measure of coaches' success are outcomes. And so when I watch teams that win games, they play their best, um, they may not be the smartest teams, but they might be the hardest working teams that play together and bring energy. But I really believe that the NHL is sort of the model of the best performance. And that means that's what people look at. And they maybe try to emulate that in minor hockey when they don't have the skills or understanding of the tactics to teach it. So that's where the, I think the uh, vacuum comes between daring to take risk about letting the game teach and coaching the way we've always coached was it's traditional. And I think what's happening in the NHL is that coaches, they allow their assistants to run more of the practices the practices are very tactically game related at the NHL level. Um, and the coach is basically an observer observing what everything is doing and ask, asking the players, learning from the players about what should we do moving forward. So I, I think they're getting it at the highest levels. But as far as minor sports go, I'm I'm not so sure. So I don't know whether Kim and your observation this makes sense at all, but I wonder if you could comment, Kim, on that. Yeah, I think 
even with minor hockey coaches, they tend to drift towards what they're comfortable with, which, you know, we all played in an era where it was mostly flow drills and systems, right? So, you know, 20 years ago when I was playing minor, okay, it's 30 years ago now, I, I lied. Um, you know, the drills look very different. Now, then I had uh, Dave McMaster as my coach, who I think many people on this call would know. Um, so that was a bit of a gift, and it certainly wasn't, uh, system based in the way that he coached. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Dave coached uh, University of Toronto men's and women's teams forever and then coached with the national team in 90 when they wore the pink and white jerseys. Um, and then we were fortunate enough to have him at Leaside uh, for a number of years when I was playing. And his practices were a little bit more skill-based and then game-based. So it wasn't a lot of standing around pass here. Um, uh, it was a little bit more being creative. So maybe he was before his time. Um, but even now, I'm running a lot of teams training camps this week. Um, and there are a lot of other teams running their training camps on the other pads around us. Uh, and I would say, for the most part, our younger coaches. Um, so at the U13, U11, and I coach the U9 teams, it's very much um, skill, concept, small area games there still seems to be a bit of um, desire or want or nervousness at the U15 and U18 to get into the, the systems right away. Um, so I think that, you know, it's maybe more born of the fact that these coaches have coached a little longer. They think they have some secret sauce or some secret power play that's going to be the difference maker. Um, so even with the teams I'm running this week that are U15 and U18, a few of them have said, oh, like, could we have the last 30 minutes to work on team stuff? Which I sort of think, like, of course, you know, you're paying for it. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, working on breakouts by, you know, working on breaking pressure one on one and skating it out yourself is it's still a breakout drill. You can call it a breakout drill uh, without having the players just stand on the wall. So, you know, I'm biased, obviously, with our organization in trying to change people's minds about just teaching skills and systems and the concept bridge that comes in between, but watching the boys, um, you know, training camps that were going along around us, there was a lot of, you know, uh, hard skating, um, you know, up and back, up and back, that sort of thing. A lot of flow, um, which is always really exciting to watch um, when they haven't been on the ice and they can't pass. Cause that's of course the number one thing that goes when you haven't played for a while. So Flow drills are especially exciting to watch at the end of August. Um, so I, I don't know. And again, that's just a small subset. Um, and obviously training camp is an exciting and uh, scary time, I think, for coaches because um, they think they know what they have and they don't know what everybody knows. Uh, but based on what I saw, um, you know, there's still coaches who are, you know, I saw a team doing their ozone attack with five players and the coach saying, now you pass here and then you pass here. And then you pass here. Um, so I'm not sure how much we've changed. Uh, but, you know, there's still, you know, people watch the Leafs here and go, oh, well, like, let's run a 1-3-1 one, one power play or, you know, whatever it is, because that's what they see on TV without knowing that their players don't have um, the skill, the hockey IQ, the conceptual knowledge of the game to be able to execute that. Um, and certainly, as, as John knows with the girls, if you tell them to stand exactly there, then of course they're always going to stand exactly there because they're lovely and they, you know, they want to do it right. And then the puck's 10 feet away and they, they don't chase after it. So because I only work with girls, I err completely on the side of like no structure. Don't, there's no X's of stand here and do this um, and, and try to make them think a little bit more. So I think that's a solution that's even better in uh, the female game uh, because of their want to be coach pleasers and do the right thing, I think we have to try even harder to make them creative <clears throat> and not script talky for them. Um, yeah. Well, thanks very much, Kim. And I, Dean, I, I know that you had me come out. You were coaching, a, I believe it was a U15 team. Might have been uh, older, but uh, um, and <clears throat> you were quite frustrated with your coaching staff because the methodology you was using wasn't something they understood or appreciated. So there's a degree of comfort here. And I'm finding that's the biggest challenge, Dean, when I mentor girls hockey. Tom does things the right way. There's a comfort with the way he's doing things. 
and it's getting success. But a few of the coaches are doing things in a traditional way, and there's nothing wrong with it. And they're very good bench coaches and extremely good motivators, and they treat the kids well. Uh, they're going to be successful on the score clock uh, using what they've done. I'm just trying to look at different ways of doing things and developing smarter hockey players because, as Tom knows, in the female side uh, last year, when he introduced the counting of passes to his team, they became conscious and aware of it, and they passed better. I don't know what you did. I don't think you passed, did deliberate passing. You just done a lot of smaller games with constraints, and they learned to pass, and you got the results. So the ability to teach the passing and the support and the timing with constraints in the games, Tom's mastered. Um, well, I think, no. Wally, can I just interject here? Please do. Yeah, I, I I don't think you can throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, just you still, I, I really like putting players together and working on the skills, you know, so they have their proper technique and they're holding their stick right and they're, you know, and they're not just slapping the puck, which is the most common thing, you know, in youth hockey, and then put that into a game. I just posted, I just posted a King's Court tournament on my uh, Facebook hockey page, and every game you keep on uh, having modified rules for the games, and then the winners move towards one way, and the ones that lost move the other way. And but before we do that, we'd work on you know, some sort of a skill. You know, it could be there can only be wrist passes or maybe goals only count on given goals, stuff like that. So I don't think, I don't think that we have this innately all inside of us and it's just to bring it out. We have to, we have to do some direct teaching too and then put the things into various games. And also, you know, I'll just leave it right there. But anyway, I want to make that point. Okay. Tom, uh, in relation to that, um, what was you said about the baby and the bathwater? Well, I think it's, we tend to go, okay, we're going to go all games. It's, it's like an education. Uh, we, we weren't having kids write and, you know, we were focused on spelling and, you know, underline subject, predicate, noun, verb, when I took English and all this, and we didn't write very much. And they went through a stage that they threw all that out, and kids are writing, but they can't spell, you know, and the sentence structure was awful. And I don't, I think you have to do fundamental skills along with the other part. You can't just assume that they're going to know all this stuff without, you know, uh, actually teaching. You can't have a kid playing hockey their whole life with their top hand, <laughs> excuse me, their thumb pointing up in the air with their top hand. You have to correct that or they'll never be any good because, you know, mechanically you can't do things. So I don't think we can throw the instruction out, but we just have to, you know, it didn't used to be any games. Like when I, when I played hockey, basically it was all outdoors and the in the Stone Age, and our practice was warm up the goalie, do a few breakouts, and then we had controlled scrimmage where we froze where we were when the coach blew the whistle. You know, you talk about team play, and then we do some fitness skating. That was practice forever, you know, and uh, then we saw the Russians and all that in 72, and everybody went crazy with drills, but they didn't pay attention that half the Russian practice was games. We just saw these drills. We'd never seen these flow drills and all this before. And we just went crazy with flow drills and threw the game right out. And anybody that used it was way behind the times. And, you know, and now I think we we can't just go to games and leave out the, you know, the the tac or technical part because it's really important. So, Tom, I, I'm sitting here embarrassed because 
uh, I was one of those who would blow the whistle and shout freeze. And I'd point out <laughs> where they were lost in the shape of their structure. They hadn't figured it out because I didn't let them to. So what happened is they they weren't thinking for themselves. So the I'm so glad you brought that up because <clears throat> I ran hockey schools where I taught those skills, like for 10, 12 years from uh, six year olds right out up to working with pros where I didn't worry about skills, but we had competitive games. There were a few tactical skills they had to learn, especially if they played defensively and working with a national team, I did do those with them. But when I was asked to coach that Bantam double A team with all of my knowledge, and I inherited the team, uh, two teams that played in the city final, I picked the litter, the best of the litter, and was in fourth place. The previous coach just played games. He had 90 games. He uh, very few practices. The reason he did that is he got hit in the head with a puck early in the year, and he asked the kids if they are in practice, and of course they said not really, and so he just played games, and he reinforced, he demanded two things, effort and respect, and he praised them. Good job, boys, way to go, way to go, and they won the cities. But you know what, Wally? In the in that era, all the research on the efficiency of practice, it, and I've done this, just videotape one kid. In a drills-based practice, you move between 7 and 11 minutes in an hour, and you stand there, you know, between 53, 49, 53 minutes in a drills-based practice. And people say, oh, we, th we need two practices for every game. Well, the game, a kid was moving more in a game if there's three lines, you know, the kid's moving 20 minutes in a game if there's three lines stop time, you know, the, uh, much more than they would in a practice. So when Ken Bracco had games all the time and he didn't run very good practices, it was better for him to play games. You know, so the, the, the secret sauce is to run practices that are efficient. And, you know, you're only standing in line for a rest, not because it's a terrible plan. You know, and, uh, you know, so I think it, I think practices have changed a lot since, you know, the 70s or whatever you're talking about. I think probably the 70s. Yep. Tom, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Dean, sitting back and thinking, Dean, uh, you're doing research on this. You've studied it. You're aware of it. And are being able are, are able to express it in an academic way where it scientifically it just speaks to what it's worth it's valuable so dean any comments on this dilemma of coaches who aren't as educated as us and experienced as us they haven't made as many mistakes as us growing up and i think like I said before, the sharks are, the older you go, the more you don't know. You realize how much there is to learn. So, Dean, I wonder if you can comment and uh, we can tie back into uh, your research a bit and maybe the work John's doing. And John, if you have anything on your mind that sort of connects with what we're saying, we'd sure love to have you speak to it. Dean first. I think Tom brings up a, an interesting point, um, and he he really put um, the practices that Ken Bracco was running back in the 70s and that you were commenting on into perspective, and I think that's a really important thing here. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I started on the outdoor ice as well, Wally, and I didn't move indoors until the Pee Wee era. And the practice that you described, um, you know, that was our typical minor hockey practice where there was a lot of skill and technique and standing around. Um, if we were lucky, we got to, um, 
a controlled scrimmage with lots of fitness skating. Um, you know, we used to, based on your hockey schools back in the day, Wally, we used to call them wallies when we had to skate back and forth across the ice. So <laughs> for whatever it's worth, um, I did curse you a lot of times whenever other coaches adopted your, um, your infamous wallies over and backs. Um, you know, geez. Anyway, um, but I, I like what Tom said there about his the research data and George Kingston had, had um, he was my first exposure and he took a sabbatical in the early 70s, I think twice to study minor hockey and to study um, statistics and metrics like, um, you know, puck time on the stick and uh, possession and, and these things. And he looked at various countries and development systems and, and in the 70s. And, and I would I would argue even up till today, but it was probably more prevalent back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and starting to become less so today. The amount of standing around time was still is, you know, a significant piece in in minor hockey. And I think Tom's right, like, and I'd never thought of it this way before, even though if you're running a, a typical practice, which means the coach is going to do a lot of talking and the kids are going to do a lot of standing and the activity time and time on task are going to be a lot shorter when you try to do a deliberate directed practice, just because of the nature of direct teaching, the, the, the benefits that you're going to get by playing in a scrimmage, even if you're not teaching, when you put that beside a typical directed practice, even if the coach doesn't know the game and doesn't teach and just, just scrimmages, I think the benefits for the kids are going to be much greater uh, because they're actually figuring stuff out on their own. And the game will become a teacher of sorts. John had made a comment earlier on is, um, I don't know if I wrote it down. Um, and I, so I don't know if I'm going to get it right, but he said, he said something. And, and I mean, we've heard that, and I think Tom talks about it in his book, you know, the game is the best teacher of the game, but that doesn't mean we're letting the coaches off the hook and we're, we're just going to shut up and stand back and let them play with no rules of engagement, no purpose, no intention behind our scrimmage. That, I think that's how today's um, best coaches are employing the small area games. They're, they're putting some constraints in, and then they shut up and they get back and they let the kids figure it out. So I think that that was a very good point that you made, Tom, about, you know, understanding the, the times, understanding the context, and then looking at these metrics from an efficiency point of view. But then aside from efficiency, we also have effectiveness. And so we can, we can play, we can scrimmage all the time, but if we don't put in constraints and rules of engagement and do it purposefully and have accountability and ha and, and and know what metrics we're, we're, we're looking for, I think it's still better than the old school skill and drill stand around and be active, you know, what did Tom say, like 53 minutes of a practice could be standing in 60. I did a, a, a time motion analysis for Dr. Steve Norris when his son Sam was playing Pee Wee in Cochrane. Steve brought me out because I'd worked with Joan Vickers for a few years back in the day, Wally, and uh, was exposed. That was my first exposure to decision training. And I ended up being a research assistant with her. We published a paper. It took 10 years to get published. But with Steve's son's um, peewee team, they had full ice. I think they had 13 skaters, if memory serves. And I, I had a couple of stopwatches and I was watching Sam and I kept track of how often was he moving and how often did he have the puck. And then I knew it was a 90 minute practice. I'm going, oh my God, out here in Cochrane, they're so spoiled at Pee Wee. They've got a full ice practice, 90 minutes. They had two coaches. And I, I you know, again, I'm going off a of memory here. But if I can recall, I believe in that 90 minutes, Sam was active for maybe 14. 
14 minutes out of 90. Like, Tom, that's even worse than your one hour practice when you put it into perspective. And then I looked at how much time did he have the puck or was he directly involved in the play? And it dropped down to just over a minute. You know, I, I know there's data out there on the 98 Nagano, or, or sorry, the Salt Lake, the, the 2002 Salt Lake Olympics, USA Hockey did a study. And I, I, I think they watched both the men's and the women's. I, I can't remember all the data off the top of my head, but I think they said in the gold medal game, Joe Sackick had the puck on his stick for a little over a minute. I think Haley, I think they measured her. She was like 48 seconds. And at the time, those were two of the top players in their respective sports at the highest level of performance-oriented competition in a full 60-minute game. And Wally, you had commented earlier about the NHL kind of being the model and the, and the, and the progress I'm going to be a disrupt, disruptor here, and I'm going to challenge that. John and I have been to NHL practices for too long. I quit going because I was disappointed, and um, I just didn't see the progress. I felt it was a waste of my time. John kept going. He's the observer, and I've seen all teams practice from the 90s up to the, I would say, 2010-ish era, and then I gave up. And I saw a copycat league. Um, I saw no innovation. I saw standing around. I saw flow drills. I saw inefficiency. I saw whistle control. Um, I, I could go on, but I feel they're a terrible model for minor hockey. Yeah, well, yeah, well just hold it, Dean. Uh, you said 2010. That was the last the time you watched. I know Tom and I have sat together. together. Uh, can you uh, turn your speaker, your speaker off? off get that? Get that. Yeah. Good. Um, I think it may have been true in 2010. I agree with you. But in the last six to ten years, the practices have been tactically decision-making oriented. But the situation that they start the activity out with is specific to applying to a game situation which is going to happen and then execution of the skill in a competitive one-on-one -on -one setting so tom i don't know if you can mention uh we watched the under 18 team that one year practice it was the best practice i've ever watched they were game like tactically purposeful, high tempo. They just weren't free play. Uh, I was impressed with the tactical execution of those skills at a high competitive level. And when they played in the championships, they won. So I think the balance of that thinking being built into the deliberate part of the initiation of a drill early in the drill and creating it competitively i think their practices that's what we've got they're the model they're what people watch on tv and are going to emulate uh and admire so tom can you mention uh what's your thoughts on that well like you i go and watch all those teams they didn't seem to have very many at Winsport this year but practices have improved really, really way better. But, but then it also depends who the coach is. You know, like my opinion, Mike Babcock runs the best practices. He does, you know, skill stuff, tactical stuff. And he, he's one of the only guys that uses transition games, which I think are, I, you know, I, I think transition games are the most important thing because the game is a game of transition. Each team gets a puck between three and four times each minute, 180 to 200 times a game. And if you just practice one-on-ones or two-on-ones and you blow a whistle and it's over, well, that's not hockey because you got to get the puck and, you know, make that pass, the breakout and all this. Or that's what hockey is. It's just not um, doing thing forever. But I, I think the practices of overall 
really improved compared to what they used to be. But again, it depends on the coach. So. Yeah, Tom, in, in relation to that, Daryl Belfry commented he had, I think, six of his superstars out there, like Crosby, Matthews, Marner, and uh, the, they had some other, I think, American League players, and they were playing a game of keep away in a small area. And this, they were teaching Daryl about what he wouldn't teach, which was pass to a space the player can skate onto in a small area. They were worried about direct eye contact passing. So he let them play the game of keep away and said the best players pass to a space. And they support that space. They're not there in the pass made directly to an open player. And that's next level thinking. So he, in his small area games, tactically oriented with decision making. That's an example of playing three versus three keep away. And he learned from them pass to a space. And passing to space is a really popular tactic, even one on one. Don't try to deke, just pass to a space and get to the space away from the defender. So that's where, Dean, I'm saying the NHL is becoming the sort of the model of tactical ingenuity. And that's what I call that. I, I've never thought of passing to myself off a space um, on attack. Uh, but that's a new tactic. So uh, that's where I'm saying that the people that are in the business of sport, having to be successful, having to win to keep their job and, and draw the audience, they're under pressure to stay ahead of the tactical nuances of the game. And I, I think we're learning from what they do. And when I work with the elite coaches, for instance, uh, I'm talking about surfing, not skating backwards anymore, but the tactic of surfing, which you can teach and incorporate into games. So I don't know, Dean, if that provides any sense of balance to what you were saying or not, but go ahead, uh, Dean, if you've got anything else to add. I do want to ask, I'm just going to give Rick, Sam, and Peter a heads up here sitting back with your different backgrounds in terms of what you're uh, taking away or appreciating from this. But Dean, go ahead. Let's not forget about Hal, too. He's been here. OK, the whole you're right. Sorry, Hal. Dean, Dean. Yeah, thanks, Wally. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I did watch some of the practices into after 2010, but it became more limited based on my schedule and my disappointment. And um, th since COVID, um, I haven't even bothered to try to go down to watch anything. Just, you know, the NHL changed a lot of their policies around allowing people in with, um, uh, you know, security things and that sort of thing for practice. So it became um, practices. I, I didn't find the practices were as, as open to be able to get in. And uh, I don't know if that's still the case or not, but um, I know there's been more of an emphasis on skill coaches and, um, you know, with analytics being brought in, they have more metrics. Um, nobody, I, I have not had the chance to speak with anybody who works as a analytic person. Um, it's all very clandestine. Um, nobody wants to share any information it's a you know a performance based world i understand i would really like to understand more around some of the analytics to see what they're looking for and i want to see if there is any relationship whatsoever from the analytics staff to the coaching staff and understand how they use that flow of information or if they use that flow of information what are the most common things and metrics that they're looking for and, and do coaches actually incorporate data into their practice. And I don't know if all that data is, is relevant or 
Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there, and and I don't I don't profess to understand all of it. Um, I, I like the comment that Tom made on um, the transition being, you know, I think John would would attest to this, and he always was whispering this in my ear. It's it, transition is the most important principle in hockey. And when we add whistles and the coach um, uses his whistle or her whistle to start and stop a drill, they're basically neutering that transition from their practice and they need to let it occur naturally. And when there's a, a, a poor pass or, or the, the player can't receive a pass and it bounces over their stick, don't make it easy and throw a second puck in. Don't let them go get a second puck. There shouldn't be any other pucks out there. Have them chase down that puck. Have them complete the play. Have them um, make chicken salad out of chicken poop, right? Like they've got to figure that out because that's what happens in a game. And every transition moment is a decision-making moment. And it's important for these kids to become independent creative thinkers and figure out how to solve the problems within the parameter of that game environment because that's what they do in a real game the coach can yell and shout from the bench uh, he can whisper in their ears he can yell at them whatever it's not right but that now is sometimes now that feedback encourages direct or encourages dependent thinking a lot of times instead of telling and directing i think that the coaches should move toward more of a um a questioning approach a socratic questioning approach what did you see out there what do you think of the play you made why did you make that play if you had a time machine could you go back in that same moment would you do the same thing after you saw what the outcome was of the choice you made and you can script a bunch of these things in advance or you know and, and become proficient enough to do it uh, as the play unfolds the people come back to the bench you can talk to your players and when i say talk to i basically mean question shut up listen and see what they say and what they hear because we all have different backgrounds we're all um older than 13 or 18 or nine, like most of the kids that we're working with, we have, we have um, developed into adults with certain um, perceptions and, and different lenses that we see the game. We're seeing it through, through our first person eyes elevated on a bench with no fear of being bumped into or, uh, you know, we're not immediately in the play. We're almost a third person point of view to the player's first person point of view. What I see doesn't matter really, because my reality is different from that kid's reality. I still have my coaching wisdom that I can employ through the questioning when they come back to help guide them. But I think that that's a better way than directing. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different, um, ways that we can go with this. Um, I don't know how much you, you guys, like Wally, I know you've gone down to Toronto. I don't know how much direct impact, like like if Toronto was on the road and they came to practice in Calgary and I was able to go watch, um, I don't know. My perception is that a lot of these skill coaches, um, there are times where they get the players, maybe they do, 10, 20 minutes before practice. Maybe they do 10, 20 minutes after practice. Maybe they have a separate ice time. But the practices that I see typically when teams are on the road, you know, there's a difference between a game day skate, which is very much routine, patterned, ritualistic. The purpose for that is to let the players feel good about themselves. I think they're trying to minimize decisions and change and chaos to try to build their confidence. And I don't know if that's really, I, I would have to research that, but I don't know if that's the best way to prepare for a chaotic competitive game. Dean, uh, I, I agree with you, but I also, 
uh, if you could just turn your speaker off, good. I, you know, I agree with you. The idea of chaos is good. Chaos is is really good because they are thinking and figuring it out. And I don't sh think NHL practices are as chaotic as you might desire, but there there is decision making built into them relative to the tactic you need to have an awareness you need to have of your positioning to the game situation. So in keeping with what you said, Dean, I, and I'm going to go to the other people who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Um, I was <clears throat> observing uh, U13 tryouts yesterday, or pardon me, I was at a coaching summit for uh, U13 and older of community hockey coaches, 80 coaches in the audience. And Sam Holmes is running your session on bench management. And we got talking about coaches shouting from the bench, playing the game out loud, telling their players what to do. And they're, we realize at that level, what's the right thing is to be loud enough for the players on the bench to hear and don't be negative, to identify the good things that are going on that you need to get happening in a game. So the, the work we do, the I'm doing, is practical to that coach, that team, this group, to educate them. Raising your voice on the bench and playing the game out loud, um, you're not really teaching. You might be interrupting their thinking and distracting it. But what they see at times is correct because they see the game. So that's the one thing that I think the, the line I have for the art of coaching is the right stuff, right amount, right time. And how do you do that? Well, that's what coaches have to figure out. And the best ones do the right thing.